Sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of the Environment. And I have to inform the House that questions one and four have been withdrawn. We'll start with listed questions, and I call Ms. Rosine McCorley. Uh, question two, please. The Northern Ireland Civil Service Voluntary Exit Scheme, agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive, was launched on the 2nd of March 2015. Applications were invited from all eligible staff across the NICS. Applications to the Northern Ireland Civil Service Voluntary Exit Scheme closed on the 27th of March. 459 staff from my department from across all grades and disciplines have expressed an interest in the scheme. The scheme will only operate in the 2015-2016 financial year. Staff selected will be released in tranches commencing on the 30th of September 2015, with further exits on the 30th of November, the 29th of January 2016, and the 31st of March 2016. The numbers released under the scheme will be constrained by the budget available to fund compensation payments and the need to manage the exercise in such a way that will maintain essential business continuity across the NICS departments. Due to the voluntary nature of the scheme, my department will not know the exact numbers leaving until the staff are selected and have themselves accepted the exit terms of the scheme. Applicants will be advised on the 26th of May whether they have been selected or not selected, and those leaving in the first tranche exit on the 30th of September 2015 will be confirmed. Compensation quotes will be made available to staff leaving in the first tranche on the 16th of June, and staff will have until the 30th of June to confirm their acceptance. Staff leaving in the later exit tranches during 15-16 will receive the same three months' notice. Well, Ms. McCorley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister how will he ensure the same level of service is maintained with a reduced workforce through the voluntary exit scheme? And the Minister give a firm commitment that there will be no compulsory redundancies? I uh, thank the, the, the member for the question. I have from the outset said that there would be no compulsory redundancies uh, from my department and I reiterate that here today and give that assurance to the member, to the House and to the staff of the department. Uh, as regards how we ensure that we retain the necessary <coughs> expertise within the department, I do have concerns about the impact that the scheme will have with significant numbers of staff leaving all the departments in a relatively short time, although we will have to stop doing some things potentially or certainly change the way that some services are provided in order to live within the reduced budget. It is essential that the staff remaining in the department are given the necessary skills and knowledge to continue to provide the required services. My officials will use the three-month notice time frame of each exit tranche to assess the impact of losing such experienced staff and consider how best to manage the reduction and compensate for any loss of experience and knowledge. We must maximise and develop the skills of those staff remaining and provide the succession training and development opportunities to minimise the adverse impact of losing such experienced staff with such expertise. The whole purpose of the voluntary exit scheme is to make reductions to staff costs and there is a need for all business areas within my department and all departments to evaluate their work programmes and determine priorities and the resourcing required. Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal Depu uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister may be aware I just came out of the committee, uh, just came out of a meeting with the NGO and Queen's in relation to, the, um, to funding to the sector, uh, which is facing huge uncertainty, not only this year, but more so next year with the new department. 
The Minister, uh, in your briefings to the Committee, has not given any assurance or any explanation of how the savings uh, will, will be used. Can I ask the Minister to give us a commitment that any savings from the voluntary exit scheme will be used to fund the voluntary sector and the likes of Queen's, which are really doing the work of the Department in discharging the statutory duties of DOE? I uh, thank the Chairperson of the Environment Committee for her, her question. However, I do reject the uh, assertion that I have not given assurances uh, to the Committee of my commitment uh, to the NGO sector. The, there is a question tabled later on this afternoon on this uh, precise uh, topic. I recognise fully the, 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 work of the, work, uh, the, the value of the work of the NGO uh, sector and have given them, I believe, assurances uh, of that recognition. I uh, pledge to work with them throughout this year. I recognise and indeed share some of their concerns about what the future may hold in a new department, and that's why I think it's vitally important that we do work with the sector this year to establish priorities, environmental priorities. The, the, the chairperson of the committee is quite correct, however, in that I can't at this stage say what money realised through uh, early exits will be spent on. We don't at this stage know what money, if any, will be realised through uh, th these exits. Uh, th th this was obviously an outpouring of the Stormont House Agreement, and as yet we have to see that implemented and, and, and see how that works out. However, while there are other pressures on my department, and, and, and the member has previously raised that of road safety, the budget for which I have had to half this year as a result of, of the budget settlement, I would be keen that should money be saved, I redirect some towards it. There is also the issue of the rate support grant which goes to less well-off councils. They have been disproportionately <coughs> adversely impacted upon uh, by this budget, and that is something that I would like to reinstate as well, not to mention the listed building grant, which has been completely decimated. So there are a lot of areas <laughs> that we have to spend money on, and unfortunately not a lot of money to spend on them. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister has intimated here today that uh, the figure is 459 of the staff have declared an interest in the exit scheme. Can he tell us, is that above or below his expectations? And furthermore, how does that equate in terms of monetary terms, please? Unfortunately, at this stage, I cannot uh, put my finger on how this would translate into uh, monetary terms. As I've said, these are from across all grades uh, w within the department. As regards my own expectations, the initial figure that, that, that I had given was 500 staff. We then revised that to 400. So it's somewhere in between. Uh, clearly, I don't want to be in a position where anyone has to lose their, their post. I've outlined in my previous answer to Ms Lowe the need to manage these exits in such a way that uh, service remains as was, and, although some, maybe including Lord Morrow, would like to see service improve in certain service er areas w within the department. When money, or if money, is realised, I will look at where that money uh, should be allocated. Clearly, we do not know if these 400 odd people are actually going to leave. If their bid will be accepted, and if the offer made to them will be acceptable to them. Call on Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for his answer. And as the lone ranger who came to the aid of the DVLA workers in Coleraine, will this voluntary exit scheme in any way uh, help those people who still haven't found permanent positions? I, I thank the, the member for that question. I believe that lessons can be, and indeed lessons were learned from the voluntary exit scheme that was run uh, to deal with the DVA situation 
in Coleraine uh, last year. In fact, it, it was almost used as a model for this wider VES scheme by uh, the, minister, the then Minister for Finance and Personnel. One uh, point that I have raised with executive colleagues is that we should look at the VES scheme as an opportunity to actually rebalance the distribution of civil service posts across the North, and it should not be seen as an opportunity or as an excuse to further centralise functions. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Obviously, all Ministers are going to have a difficulty with experience levels maintaining them. Could I ask the Minister when he hopes to know how much money will be available for the voluntary exit scheme, the actual cap of the monies that have been talked about? I, I thank Mr. Cree for that supplementary question, as outlined in previous answers. However, uh, we do not know yet. It's hoped that we should know by the end of June how much will be realised. We'll also, at that stage, have a, a better grasp of when these savings will be realised at different stages throughout the year. At that stage, I will be looking again how to disseminate uh, that money, and we will hopefully, in turn, be able to provide a bit more certainty to the likes of the NGOs to which Ms Lowe referred and those in other sections of the department about their budgets for the remainder of this year. Call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three. The High Hedges Act, Northern Ireland 2011, came into operation in March 2012. And whilst the leg legislation was introduced by my department, responsibility for its implementation rests with councils. As my department does not have a role in the regulation of hedge cutting or resolving related disputes between neighbours, I am unable to comment at this stage on the effectiveness of the legislation. I am, however, intending to undertake a review of the High Hedges Act once sufficient time has been given to allow its full implementation within the new Council structures. I would anticipate that the public usage of the legislation and its effectiveness at helping to resolve neighbour disputes will be an integral part of this future review. Come Ms Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer, and uh, I, I thank him for his honesty, and that this review will take place. Um, something that was set down by this uh, Assembly, if my memory serves me right, was the fee, and that is really what I wanted to lead on to, the, three of, the fee of £350. And um, In my experience, through my office, um, I have found that that has been a, a great deterrent for many people because of the figure as, at what it is set at. Um, can I ask the Minister, when he is looking at his review, to look at that figure again and also ask him, um, is that means tested? Is he able to tell me that? I, I, I thank the member for that question. Uh, the review, I can assure the member, will be all-encompassing and uh, comprehensive and will include issues such as the fee and indeed the issue as to whether that fee or any new fee uh, should be means tested. I, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to hear from the member that it's her view that the fee itself is a deterrent because it's evident to me from looking at statistics ar around the Act that there is at least one deterrent. My department did liaise with councils during 2013 and acquired initial figures that indicated that around 800 queries about high hedges had been received, but only 8% of these actually materialised into formal complaints, and of that 8%, only 67% resulted in the issue of a remediation notice. Now, I don't know were these due to perhaps potential shortcomings in the legislation itself, or indeed the fee, or possibly a combination of both. Call Mr. Barry McElduff. Uh, can I say to the Minister that a lady from the Tamlet Road area of Oma brought this to my attention within the last week, that uh, light is blocked going into her kitchen, that it's having a very detrimental impact on her amenity. What advice would the Minister have for that lady who cannot, cannot afford the £350 fee? Uh, I thank uh, the, the member for the question. Obviously, 
his interpretation of a high hedge might be different to mine. <laughs> My uh, uh, advice uh, to the lady in question would be, at, from the outset, or at the outset, to contact her uh, local council. I do know from my own experience as a constituency MLA that I have often encouraged and even on occasion facilitated mediation, if you like, between neighbours to do this, carry out this kind of necessary work uh, informally. Call Mr Robin Swan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I can assure the Minister his interpretation of a high hedge is definitely different from mine. <laughs> but I think if he knew the legislation, it's actually stipulated in it as well. Again, going back to, to the fee issue, will the Minister give a commitment to, to reassess that? Because I've had the same issues raised with myself that the £350 fee is actually a deterrent for many people going forward and actually going through this piece of legislation to an extent that they actually see this legislation as being pointless. I thank uh, the member uh, for that question. I have given the assurance already to uh, Ms Bradley, and I will repeat that assurance to Mr Swan that the review will be all-encompassing and will include uh, fees uh, for the, the, the pursuit of complaints using this legislation. It is vital that whenever we do manage to get legislation through this House, that it's legislation that isn't pointless, it's legislation that matters to people, and it's legislation that helps people. Unfortunately, as I've said, the statistics around us, while it does show that we have managed to help some people with regards to uh, re remediation and alleviation of neighbour disputes, there is a lot more, in my opinion, that could be done. It's well known that good fences make good neighbours. I think you could just as easily say that high hedges or bad hedges make bad neighbours. And it's up to us, or me as Minister, with responsibility for this legislation and, as I said, the councils for their implementation of it to ensure that we work it as well as we can or we change it to make it work better. Called Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, number five, Principal Timothy Speaker. My department has suffered a higher percentage of cuts than any other department. I am therefore determined to ensure that the carrier bag levy monies are used to best effect. The net income from the carrier bag levy after administration costs is estimated to be £4.2 million pounds for 2015 16. I have already agreed allocations totalling £2.15 million pounds for environmental grants and schemes to include £0.52 million for the Natural Heritage Grant Fund, £0.6 million for a Community Waste Fund and £0.3 million for local clean-up and air quality grants. However, further to my pledge to do as much as I can to try and lessen the pain for environment groups, I set up on April 23 a workshop held in Crawford's Burn Country Park to discuss how best to allocate the remaining carrier bag funding through a new natural environment fund. The workshop was attended by 22 environment NGOs, and I listened carefully to the concerns that emerged. These organisations needed more money to tackle the acute environmental priorities facing us here in the north, such as safeguarding our most valuable sites and landscape, protecting our priority species and encouraging access to the countryside. For that reason, I have increased the remaining allocation for the fund from £1 million to £1.25 million. Pounds. The new fund opened for applications from 1 May. Finally, I have also agreed that of the remaining £0.8 million pounds on allocated carrier bag income, £0.3 million is channelled through a new challenge fund targeted schools and community schemes, and that £0.5 million pounds is allocated to the listed building grant schemes specifically targeted at projects that provide facilities for community access and use, including churches. Mr McGuinness for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could I commend the Minister in trying to um, <clears throat> fund as many uh, environmental NGOs as possible, given the uh, very brutal settlement that the Minister received in terms of his budget allocation. And could I ask you, 
uh, could I ask the Minister, in relation to the June monitoring round, uh, has the Minister uh, put in a bid in relation to environmental NGOs uh, and allocating monies to them uh, within that round? I thank uh, the, the member for the question, and yes, he certainly can take this opportunity to commend me. <laughs> I have received a significant number of correspondence and assembly questions from all political parties supporting the funding of ENGOs, and I look forward to the same level of support from the same parties as I try to do exactly uh, what the member has suggested and bring forward a bid in the June monitoring round. Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister to give any examples of environmental projects that may benefit from the funds from the carrier bag levy in my East London Dairy constituency? I uh, thank the, the member for that question. Now, I did re refer there to £0.3 million pounds of this going into a new challenge fund that will be open to bids from schools and community groups. as much similar to the previous uh, challenge fund and which were availed of by numerous projects in uh, the East Derry constituency. Re regards to the other money, I do know that Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust do a lot of work that encompasses some of the members' constituency and other constituencies as well, and they will indeed, or have already been, a, a, a recipient of some of the carrier bag levy money and are currently participating in the, the process to hopefully for them obtain further funding from that source. Call Ms. Megan Farron. Can I ask the Minister to clarify if the Ring of Gullion project, which had its funding pulled, will benefit from the carrier bag levy, and if so, to what extent? I thank uh, the, the member for that question. Over the past couple of weeks, I have already uh, given the, made a decision and given the direction that the Ring of Gullion, which just due to the funding cycle it was in, lost funding altogether as of the 31st of, of March in the last financial year, be afforded funding for the three months from the end of March to the end of June. During that time, they are also participating in the process that I have established, and I know from engaging with them personally that they are hopeful of a positive outcome. I can't predetermine any outcome of that process, as I'm sure the, the member will appreciate. Well, Ms. Sandra Overend. I, th I thank the Minister uh, for his responses so far. Uh, and in fact, I'd hope to, to ask about that June monitoring round as well. So I'll, I'll adapt my question and ask, does the Minister feel that Rivercare Limited in, in Cookstown, who work in the, the Ballandere River, will be eligible under the funding that is now available? I, I thank the, the, the member for that question, and, and I have in the past visited some work of the work and projects being done in that area, and, and, and indeed see it to be very valuable work. I'm not sure, I will check and get back to the member, if the group to which she refers has been included in the 22 groups that have to date participated in this scheme and are participating <coughs> in it, and I will get back to the member on that as soon as possible. Mr. Trevor Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I heard Mr. McGuinness's uh, commendation of his minister a few moments ago, but I must say that the, out in the ground, the impression would be that the minister's engagement with environmental NGOs in the run into the budget was haphazard, to say the least. Is, is he satisfied that he fully engaged with those organisations before taking these budget decisions? I uh, thank the, the, the member for that question, and I will have no, I have no problem putting my hand up and saying my engagement with him was not perfect. However, I do think I engaged with the sector reasonably well as far back as the draft budget, uh, which I was the, the only minister to, to vote against. Uh, they, they formed very much part of, of the public consultation. Uh, exercised. I encouraged these NGOs to respond. These NGOs did all respond uh, to the draft budget, and maybe that played some role in changing some parties and some ministers' minds as to whether they supported the, the budget or not. 
the, the member will appreciate the degree of uncertainty facing all ministers with their own budgets and, and, and therefore the difficulty that ministers had juggling their budgets, uh -huh. <laughs> contracted though they were, and deciding on how best to spend the reduced resources at their disposal. I have been fortunate enough, I suppose, to be able to avail of the carrier bag levy money, I think, subsequent to uh, my budget being announced and the impact that it was having on ENGOs, that they will be reasonably happy with how I have engaged with them and will continue to engage with them throughout this year in advance of the restructuring of departments. Mr. Sammy Douglas. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, question number six, please. The road safety strategy recognises cyclists as a vulnerable road user group and includes a range of actions that relate to cyclist safety. A new cyclist safety television campaign entitled Don't Forget was launched in April 2014, where both cyclists and drivers are encouraged to take personal responsibility for their behaviour on the roads and to give other road users due consideration. The core message here is respect everyone's journey. The campaign messages are addressed more fully in the online campaign available on NI Direct, where each scenario in the ad is developed and more detailed advice is provided to drivers and cyclists alike. The campaign has been supported by outdoor, digital and social media activity. A cyclist safety education pack based on the television campaign has been developed and made available to all schools and other interested organisations. This includes an eight-minute DVD, which provides a wealth of advice for cyclists. Some clips from the DVD are also available on YouTube, namely the use of cycle lanes and HGV and cyclist blind spots. Each year, my department offers the Cycling Proficiency Scheme, or CPS, to every primary school in Northern Ireland. Following a review of CPS, my department has developed an enhanced CPS, which began rolling out to schools in February this year. New resources for this have been delivered to all participating schools and are also available on the Teachers Network C2K. This enhanced CPS is currently being delivered to 542 primary schools. In anticipation of the launch of the Belfast Bike Scheme, my department ran a Cyclist Safety social media campaign, one of many it has rolled out over the last 12 months, on its Share the Road to Zero social media pages, delivering advice to cyclists and drivers alike as they share the road. Well, Mr Douglas for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, the Minister did mention about the Belfast Bike Scheme. And I'm sure he is aware that when people do go and hire a, a, a bicycle, they're not provided with a helmet. Certainly on a recent visit to Utrecht in the Netherlands, I, I saw thousands of cyclists, and I actually counted four people um, with a cycle um, helmet. So could the Minister maybe outline what the Department's um, view is on, on cycle helmets? I thank uh, the, the member for that question, and would also take this opportunity, as opposed to commend the work of my ministerial colleague uh, Danny Kennedy in uh, bringing forward and launching the Belfast Bike Scheme, which uh, by all accounts has been a tremendous success to date. Obviously, safety is a key consideration and should be a key consideration when it comes to anyone getting on a bike, and the issue of cycling helmets is one that has raised its head, if you like, uh, before in this chamber. I believe it predated my time, not only as Minister, but in this chamber, that there had been attempts to bring forward legislation or a bill which would make mandatory the wearing of helmets on bicycles. And I believe that uh, attempt kind of withered on the vine whenever we, it was looked at how this worked or, or how things worked in other jurisdictions, such as Holland, where it was actually proven that more fatalities occurred when cyclists were wearing uh, helmets. From a personal perspective, I know that if my son is going out on a bicycle, I'll insist upon him wearing a, a, a helmet. And I believe it, it is up to the individual. But if it was up to this individual, cyclists would wear helmets. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Basil McRae. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, is the Minister aware that the drought in California is entering its fourth year and is likely to be much more severe, and that NASA have predicted that droughts in the southwest of America will last for 40 years? Does he think that this has any relevance to Northern Ireland? I thank the member uh, for the question. I've often criticised topical questions and said they should be maybe renamed typical questions, but Mr McRae's question is certainly far from typical. Uh, I believe that the impact of climate change is global, and I believe, therefore, it is of relevance to people not just here in Northern Ireland, but people everywhere. And it's uh, for that reason that I hope to pursue and bring forward legislation on climate change uh, before the end of this Assembly term. Well, Mr McRae for supplementary. I commend the Minister for being able to follow the train of thought. Uh, there is an issue of climate change. The science is absolutely unforgiving. We are having a really serious uh, problem throughout the world. And I think it's something that Northern Ireland needs to realise it should not uh, reject its responsibilities on. So I would be interested in hearing from the Minister specifically what issues can we introduce in Northern Ireland that will play our part in tackling climate change? I, I thank uh, the member for that question. And I think it's fair enough to say that good work has already been done in terms of mitigation, in terms of adaptation uh, for climate change. But in order to support these efforts, we need change in legislation and to give legislative support to those efforts, not just by my department, although as Minister for Environment I retain responsibility for climate change policy, but I believe everyone in this chamber has a responsibility all ministers and all government departments have a responsibility, and I think we should start off by practising what we preach. I look at uh, DRD, for a, a, a example, and wonder whether more could be done in terms of using LED streetlights and initiatives su such as that, where we can reduce our own greenhouse gas em emissions and our carbon footprint whether we're telling our constituents to do just that. Well, Mr. David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. On the matter of uh, planning applications with the Department, have taken steps uh, like the introduction of the streamline process in recent years to help flows. There now appears to be a backup uh, of planned applications during the crossover period of setting up with the new councils. Can the Minister give us an assessment on the situation? Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for that question. The transfer of the planning function, or the majority of planning functions, to the 11 new councils has been a massive task. We're talking here about the transfer of over 400 staff and of over 6,500 live applications. And while would, the transition has been relatively smooth, I cannot stand here and tell you that it has been seamless, there, that there have been minor issues in places with the transfer of staff, with the transfer of, of, of cases over. However, I have outlined previously in the Chamber the benefits of planning going to local councils, and I believe that given time, and hopefully it won't take much time uh, for the new systems to be in, the member and all members, and most importantly, members of the public, will see improvements in the processing of planning applications and in the timeliness of their processing. I call Mr. Hilditch for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal. I do thank the Minister for his response. Uh, however, I know in my own area of Mid and East Antrim there are, are site visits which are maybe three to four months outstanding at this stage. And we just asked if the Minister would take an opportunity to have a look at the situation. Certainly, if, if the member or if any member uh, can come to me with specific problems on specific applications, I will be happy to follow those up with the relevant council. I did say prior to transfer, however, that I, I, I don't want to be in a position where you're micromanaging the councils and constantly looking over their shoulder. However, I had also uh, said on numerous occasions in this House that there would be the need for a, a degree of hand-holding as the new councils find their feet and I get to grips with what is a huge new responsibility 
for them. However, it's worth outlining again, I suppose, that we have also transferred 400 highly qualified and motivated planning staff. They are now working for the councils. In many cases, it will be the same planning officers dealing with the same applications. And therefore, I'm certainly hopeful and optimistic that they will get the, the show back on the road very soon. Well, Mr. Adrian McWillan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, the National Environment Fund is open at the moment. Can I ask him how many applications have been to date on that fund and what criteria will be used to sub out the applications? Uh, I thank the, the member for that question and, and I refer back to one of my answers in actual oral questions to a, a question from Mr McGuinness and even that was preempted by a, a supplementary from Ms Lowe and that was around the, the Natural Environment Fund which opened on the 1st of May. To my knowledge to date there have been 22 applications or 22 groups involved in, in, in the process thus far and we are looking in terms of criteria at, at, at the work that they clearly do. I am determined to ensure that the carrier bag levy where the money for the Natural Environment Fund coming from, that their monies are used to best effect, particularly in these austere times. We are looking at the management of our areas of outstanding natural beauty, we are looking at protection of uh, species and we are also looking at access to the, the countryside, among many other things, performed by our valuable and valued ENGO sector. Mr. McQuillan, for a supplementary. Thank you. And can I then also ask the Minister, how can we marry that together with the numerous wind farms that are being erected around this sort of environment that we're trying to protect? That's where they, they aim to put most of the wind farms. So how can we marry the two together and sort of make sure they both can love together? I, I, I thank the member for that question. I have to outline that we don't aim to put wind farms anywhere. Applicants come forward with proposals to put wind farms in locations, and a DOE, or now largely the councils, will assess as to whether those locations are suitable or not. And in assessing the suitability of locations, these are precisely the factors that should be taken into consideration. If there is an area of outstanding natural beauty, an area of special scientific interest, how much, I suppose, detrimental impact is a wind farm or a wind turbine likely to have in that? Or, and then weigh that up, I suppose, against the wider economic and environmental benefits of renewable energy that are recognised quite categorically in our programme for government. So there is definitely a balance to be struck, and I'm confident that that balance can be struck and is being struck. Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, given that the overriding key benefits of RPA were to ensure better service provision and long-term cost savings, does the minister think it is acceptable that, in addition to rates increases for some constituents, there are those who have been transferred to a new council area who are also being levied with additional charges for a council service? I uh, thank the, 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 the member for that question. Certainly. Uh, <laughs> money, shall I say, or finance, was a consideration and a motivation behind the review of public administration. I have always said that reform was not just about doing things cheaper, though it was also about doing things uh, better. And it has to be better, not just for local government, not just for central government, it has to be better for the ratepayer, for the, the, the citizen. And these hikes uh, to which uh, Ms Cochrane Affairs, I'd possibly need to get a, a wee bit more detail on them. Now, my predecessor was able to secure from the executive uh, £30 million pounds by way of a rates convergence scheme, so that uh, where you're going to have two areas coming together with hugely different rates bases, that one area would not have a huge hike in their rates purely on the basis of convergence. Uh, to my knowledge, that has been uh, su successful. Obviously, local government has a, a major role to play here as well. And uh, 
I'd be happy, like I said, to, to, to hear the examples from the member. Call Mrs. Cochran for a supplement. Um, uh, thank the, the Minister um, for his answer, and, and uh, I do appreciate that the Rates Convergence Scheme has cushioned the blow um, to some constituents, but what advice um, can you give um, to those constituents who have been informed that they now must purchase a new bin in order to fit the refuge vehicles of the new council area that they now find themselves in, so that they can actually have their waste collected? Well, uh, the collection of waste is, is, is a hugely important issue, and, and where you have councils converging who have maybe different waste policies and waste c collection policies, this was always uh, going to present as an issue. Uh, my, my department has been able to, and will to a much lesser extent uh, this year, be able to assist some councils as they roll out new <laughs> waste collection schemes. Uh, I, I, I think it is important that we look at waste management in even broader terms, rather than on a council by council basis, and uh, to, to that end, I, I have made known my desire, I, I, I suppose, or preference to see a move away from the, the currently three waste management partnerships to maybe one o overlooking uh, waste management right across the north. Call Mr. Cathal O'Shea. Uh, I've got a previous question. Uh, can the Minister provide assurances around the future long term sustainability of the environmental NGO sector given the removal of funding in recent times? I, I thank uh, the, the member for that question. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm happy to provide him of the assurance of my commitment uh, to the survival of this hugely important and indeed vital. Uh, sector. I spoke earlier of the huge environmental challenges, challenges facing us as a region. I also spoke of the huge challenges facing my department as we face into the VES and the very real prospect of losing skills and expertise and experience from uh, certain areas. In my opinion, that, that makes the NGO sector and our partnership with them even more important than ever. Mr. O'Shane for a supplementary. Uh, Gormer, I got the brief last and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister and his department assure us that they will work towards multi annual funding so that we avoid uh, a similar crisis uh, at the end of March next year? Well, my department will just still just about uh, be here by the end uh, of March next year. I think this is something that Ministers should not just be looking at in terms of their own departments. I think it is something that all departments should be looking at to be able to give the certainty to groups that will allow them to get on with the valuable work that they are doing. You see this in, in, in many sectors, not, not least in I suppose, terms of neighbourhood renewal areas and projects where so many uh, worthy projects and organisations are constantly chasing funding and they are spending as much time applying for funding and keeping the wolf from the door as you like, than they are actually performing the function that they are getting funded to do in the first place. And to me, that is completely unsatisfactory, not to mention how unsettling it is for the, the, the staff of those organisations. Call Mr. Gardner and ask Mr. Gardner to be brief. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister explain how smoke a free zones through controlled orders are determined across Northern Ireland. I, I, I could possibly be briefer than Mr. Gardner and say, and say uh, no. Uh, the de designation of smoke-free zones is something that's done in collaboration uh, with local councils as well. The member will be aware that, uh, and that has indeed been the subject of a recent debate in the chamber around a cross-border study into uh, the impact of burning. Fuels. Uh, I expect a report to the House again shortly on that uh, current piece of work being done in collaboration with the Government in the Republic of Ireland. I will certainly at that opportunity fill the, the, the member in on the smoke controlled zones. Time is up. 